lost your daughter, don't you? And I broke down in tears, man. I was sobbing like a little baby, but they were tears of joy. Villages that outlie that area also need the gospel. And we're planning on going there, Lord willing. And then finally, Bihar, India. Bihar, India is a state in northern India adjacent to Nepal. 110 million people who are unreached for Jesus Christ. Why is that the case? It's because one-third of the year they're in flooding, one-third of the year they're in drought, and the rest of the time they're just surviving. There's so much disease and so much malnutrition and so many other things down there. People are afraid to go in. It's not if you're going to get sick, it's when. And Lord willing, I'm going to be one of those leaders that goes down in there. If I expire on the mission field, then praise God. So what is commitment? What does it really look like? It's a decision that you have to make to kill all your other options. One of the hardest decisions that I ever had to make was to take my daughter, who will be turning 16 soon, precious to my heart, and my son, who at that time was 18, and to take them into a Security 3 country where I knew that there was a possibility of my daughter being kidnapped and trafficked and my son being hurt or killed because he's spreading the gospel. It's illegal to spread the gospel in that country. And I was nervous and I was scared. But the first step of faith is courage. And so I got into God's wheelbarrow that day. And I said, Lord, take my life. Take my family. They're yours anyway. What do I think that I've got the control for? Take them and use them for your glory. My son, for the first time in his life, was able to present the gospel to somebody else that he didn't even know in a language he couldn't even understand. My daughter knows for sure she's called to full-time missionary work. Several others that went on that trip now have the call of God on their life to impact this world with the gospel. We need to trust. That is to walk by faith and to get into God's wheelbarrow, so to speak, and let God bring the success. You see, that's where we get the equation backwards. We sometimes think we have to work harder or work smarter when really we just need to get out of the way. So here's your challenge for today. What are you doing here? Did you come to get or did you come to give? This is not where I step on your toes and make you feel miserable. It's just a question. Ask yourself, what am I doing here? Not just in this room, not just with this church, but what am I doing here as a Christian? Where's my commitment, Lord? What is my passion? And if I don't have it, Lord, will you give me one? Second question is, what excuses do you give to the Lord? I mean, I've got so many excuses, it's just crazy. And I keep offering up those excuses over and over and over. Yeah, but Lord, I don't speak well. And Lord, I'm scared about going into these shops. And Lord, I've got this. And the Lord just simply says, you know what? I'll take care of all of that. Just commit your way to me. Trust, and I'll bring it to pass. What is the Lord whispering to you right now? I'm going to end with this very brief biblical illustration. We all probably know the story of Elijah. There's a point in time when Elijah, who was a prophet of Israel had uh, given a, a little bit of a contest to a few of the priests of Baal, 450 priests to be specific. And he said, the God who rains down fire onto this sacrifice and onto this altar, he is the true God. And he asked the nation of Israel, who at that time was wavering in their faith, they weren't able to make a commitment. They didn't throw away their other options yet. He asked them a very specific question. Why are you stuck between two opinions? If God be God, serve Him. But if Baal be God, serve Him. So he let the priests of Baal go first, and we all know the story. They cut themselves. They jumped up and down. They did all sorts of funny things, and nothing happened. So Elijah, I like this guy. I got a little cocky. Okay, He got some water out, and he dumped it all over the sacrifice, soaked the wood, filled up the whole ring of rocks with water so that it was standing water. He uh, prayed a little bit. 
And the next thing you know, God sends his answer by fire, takes the sacrifice, takes the wood, takes the stones, laps up the water. And then he says, grab those priests of Baal and kill them. And the people did. 450 of them died that day. And Jezebel, the queen of Israel at the time, who was a wicked lady, she was a, a sorceress, and those were her priests, got really torqued at that. She says, well, whatever happened to them is going to happen to you now. And so what did Elijah do? He tucked tail and ran. I mean, he had the God of all gods on his side, and he tucked tail and ran. And he ran away, and he got underneath this tree, and he said, oh, Lord, just let me die. Just let me die. And that's like so many of us, isn't it? We have these ebb and flow times in our Christian life. We get on top of things. We feel great. We get down in the valley and say, oh, Lord, let me die. I just need the comfort of this tree. Let me die. And the Lord sent an angel, and the angel kind of kicked him around a little bit and said, get up. Go over to the mountain of God. He's got something to show you. And so he went to the mountain of God, Mount Horb. And when he was on that mountain, he was in a cave, the mouth of a cave, and God came by in a whirlwind. But Elijah said, no, God is not, that whirlwind is not God. And then there was a fire, but God is not in the fire. And then there was an earthquake, and Elijah said, no, God is not in the earthquake. And then there was a still, small voice that spoke to Elijah, and he covered his face and worshipped the Almighty God. Because for the first time, I think, in his life, he began to understand that it's not about the elements and it's not about the miracles. It's that our God is a personal God, that he loves us so much, that your value is in your placement in Jesus Christ. You, if you are in Christ, are a prince or a princess sitting here right now. And you need to take your value from that. And then God said this to him, get back to work. Get back to work. What are you doing in this cave? He asked him that very question. What are you doing here? And our, Elijah offered up the excuses. He said, no, get back to work. So that's my encouragement to you today. If you're a child of God, don't wait for the miracles to happen outside somewhere. You've got the fire of God inside you. Get fired up, man. Get stoked about your service for Jesus Christ. It is the ultimate journey without a doubt. And just like God asked Elijah, is God calling you right now to go to that mountain? This picture is Mount Everest. I'm 51 years old. And I have a desire to stand on top of that mountain someday. And I can't wait to see what the Lord's going to do. I may never get to the peak, but I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to climb everything that I can possibly find around that, searching for villages or whatever I can find so that I can preach the gospel there. And it is the best adventure in all of life. I've never felt so more alive than I do today. I am so sorry that I only have a possibility of 20 or 30 years left of my life. I wish I had another 30 years to give because it's so exciting to see what God does in our lives. So you got two choices today. You can be like Elijah and be frozen in your cave of fear. That's okay. You'll stand before Christ someday and you'll offer up your excuses and he'll wipe the tears away and say, I had so much planned for you, but I can't give you the rewards for it right now. But don't worry. You're still here in heaven with me. And he'll embrace you and he'll love you. And I don't know, maybe make you a janitor or something. I don't know what. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Or you can get fired up. You can get fired up and get excited about the fact that Christ has chosen you to be part of his miraculous work. And you can see God work miracles through you. This is our team witnessing to those ladies who are sick with AIDS on the benches in Nepal. And so all I can ask you today is to do this. Will you please ask the Lord what he has for your life? I mean, really dig down deep. Make that commitment to him. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the opportunity today to be able to share your word with these people. They are so 
wonderful that they're so intent on being able to be focused on your word. And just as the song said, they're, they're hungry, Father. They're thirsty for you. And I know that you have a magnificent ministry for this church, and I know that these people are part of that ministry. I pray that you would reveal it to their hearts, Lord Jesus. And if there's one here today who doesn't know you, I pray, Father, that before they leave this church, that they'll talk to me or they'll talk to another one of the leaders here or another one of the members here, that they may get that straightened out. Father, glorify yourself. And I thank you for these people's patience today. In Jesus' name, amen.